Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. Today we are talking with the amazing Richard Falks. Welcome to the show, Richard. Can't hear, can't wait to hear all your stories about publishing and sketch cards and everything else. Welcome aboard. Oh, thank you so much. I'll try to make it interesting too. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I didn't catch. I said thank you for joining us, but the first thing I would like to start with asking you about, um, you actually had set up your own design company. In the yeah. Because you were working with a photographer. Yeah, I was working, um, I worked for a commercial photographer. I was doing all of his post-production. So the Photoshop work, um, you know, depending on what people know or don't know, everybody at this point seems to know that everything is kind of, faked, highly retouched, I was doing a lot of the faking. Um, but even to the point of where, let's say there was a LeBron photo shoot, I did a lot of sportswear photography. Um, so they would shoot somebody in just a plain, like singlet, almost uniform. And then I could replace and put, they would do a second shoot when the actual product line came out. And they would shoot the shoes at an angle and shoot the clothes on and so I was replacing and putting things on so you could have this LeBron wearing seven different uh seven different outfits but done from the same base photo shoot or I was doing things like um coloring something changing oh well this this blue t-shirt now is a green t-shirt or all of the details on this shoe is changed so that was um what I was doing as a assistant to this commercial photographer his studio had to close uh, and so what happened is he gave me a list of the clients that he worked with and really helped establish me doing it freelance on my own. And that was, uh, fantastic and amazing for him to be able to do. And so that established me doing retouch. Um, then what happens is there are very busy scheduled times, uh, for doing that kind of work. And then there's really lulls in that work. And so I started filling that with more and more graphic design work. So I already had designed um, a monthly magazine and I started getting some book clients, book covers, logos, uh, other things like that to fill in. And then this guy called, uh, named Richard Parks. I was very interested. I'm a huge Mystery Science Theater fan, got involved with his trading card set. I'll get into trading card love in a minute. <laughs> but uh, Mystery Science Theater came out and his series, I believe it was series two that had a 64 card promo set. There was no initial way to get all 64 cards. So through non-sport update, I'd gotten a couple cards, traded with some people to get some others. I uh, got brave enough to ask a couple of the artists, hey, do you have some of your own cards? Oh, well, if you sign it, then I'll pay you. And I'd, I'd, I'd amassed uh, 45 or so of the 64 card set, because this is what crazy collectors do. Um, and I finally just contacted Richard saying, hey, what can I do to sort of you know complete this set? Um, and in doing that, we started talking about trading cards, which started talking about sketch cards. And I loved, I mean, the 64, Four card. It's a promotional set for one of his his um, full sets. The promotional set is its own set. I mean, it was fascinating. All of these artists had different takes on the characters, different things that were going on. I mean, it's two robots and a guy sitting watching movies, but every single artist came to it differently. Every single artist had their own approach. They had their own style, and he had really picked a wide range of artists that said and communicated so many different things and you could see everybody's love for it was there but it was different too um and so in talking to him about all of this i said you know this set is absolutely stunning it's absolutely amazing the the the, the base card set i love it i collected it but what i really want is more of this art and i said will you make just a mystery science theater you know will you make just more art sets and he said no that's really not my thing but here's the thing, you should do something like that. And I said, what are you even talking about? And he's like, you work for yourself. You have a graphic design company. You've already talked to a bunch of these artists. You've already um, you know, commissioned autographed trading cards from them. I had some sketch cards that I had commissioned from his Mystery Science Theater set. And he's like, you're already 
doing it. You don't realize it yet. You're not preparing yourself to produce this and to actually distribute it. You're already doing 80% of what it is. Now what you've got to do is come up with your own concept because you can't do mystery science theater. That's my thing. (laughs) Don't steal my thing. (laughs) So it kind of came from him sparking that. Like I literally, I, I love trading cards. I've collected trading cards and I always you were young or is it more of a recent thing no I so going way back for me um I lived in a town that was a suburb of a big town but my parents didn't like driving to that town we were very suburbanites we stayed to our own thing and so everything that I could get and consume as a child you know for myself once I had my own nickels in my pocket Um, I could go down to the plaid pantry was like a half mile bike ride. You could do about a mile bike ride to get to 7-Eleven or about three quarters of a mile away was the library. So from the library, I would check out stacks and volumes. They didn't have trade paperbacks of comics, but they did have books that were collections of a lot of newspaper strips. And so I'd collect and started looking at all of those. I started collecting newspaper strips from the actual cutting them out of the newspaper every day. And at all of the convenience stores, I found comic books and trading cards. And for a kid, you know, as a kid, everybody feels like, oh, I didn't have that much. I didn't have this or I didn't have that. But like, it literally was the first time that I was buying stuff for myself because I walked in, I had 50 cents and I could walk out with two packs of trading cards and it was stuff that I kept and it was mine. And when you're a kid, you know, you forget now we're so busy like zooming around doing all of this stuff. When you're a kid, you're laying on your bed and you look over the same 25 trading cards for hours at a time and you're reading the back. Like you can, I can still see in my mind and remember what all of those look like because it had such a specific fascination and a look. And, um, you know, we didn't have a movie theater in town. So most of the movies that I was exposed to, I was first exposed to either a comic book adaptation or the trading card series before I ever got to see the movie at like a second run theater or probably it waited till it was on cable for us. So, you know, I remember I had the Empire Strikes Back trading cards and I'd seen Star Wars on television. So I had the Empire uh, Strikes Back trading cards and I'm trying to piece together what happens in this movie from the smattering of cards that I had because I didn't know what the rest of this adventure was. And that like, it drives a kid insane in the absolute best way possible because I had yeah, probably 30, 35 cards of this 200 card set. I had no idea what the hell happened in this movie. I knew something later on happened or there's this character. This card makes absolutely no sense. I recognize this character. This is a new character. All of that stuff for, you know, a young mind that was sponging up all of this stuff and already had such a love for something that was already established. It was such a huge thing. And that's sort of So that's where like trading card love came from. And then, you know, as I got older and was able to collect, you know, buy a full set at a time or buy multiple packs. So the, then the like uh, Mars Attacks uh, reprint set came out. So I was able to buy an entire set of Mars Attacks. That was a huge set for me or the reprint of the Batman from the 1960s that painted um, set was a really huge set. And then as movies came out, you know, in the nineties, a trading card set, came out for practice. I mean, there's Howard the Duck trading cards, for God's sakes. So anything that came out, if I was remotely into the um, film, there was a trading card set to support it. And so I, 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 I have a ton of different sets for, you know, stuff that probably is not terribly good, but at the time it was even more accessible still uh, to me than the actual films themselves. So a lot of my nostalgia is through the trading cards or, or, or through, you know, the the scholastic book that I was able to get from school and so that's where that's that's a really interesting point of view I'm sorry to cut in that's a really interesting point of view one I have not heard before that you actually saw the trading cards without having seen the movie so you kind of got full of spoilers and all of that without really meaning it but you 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 know you you developed a love for the topic without even having seen it really so yeah, that it is the weirdest way to like, it, yes, it was spoilers, but it also comes up with huge misconceptions of things that I didn't understand because you don't get the entire 
story from the back of the cards. You know, there's such a smattering of what happens and you're using your imagination to fill in or to wonder what's happening. Or I didn't even, you know, I mean, I remember it took the longest time for me to figure out who this Lando guy, Lando Calrissian was this guy that was on all of these cards. This is a new character. What's he doing? It looked like in one card, Chewie's strangling him. Oh, this is the new villain. Oh, wait a minute. No, he's here hugging and they're at dinner together. Like, what the, what is this character? It would drive, you know, it would drive little nine-year-old me insane. Like, what is this character? What is going on? <laughs> Was it satisfying for you to actually finally go see the movies and find out what the story behind the whole thing was? Yeah, you know, I don't I don't know if I specifically remember. I definitely remember seeing the film. And, and at that point, I was just so blown away. Um, you know, that's when you can still be transported easily by film. So you get sucked so in. So I absolutely remember finally seeing the film in a theater. And like, I mean, the, the ad-ats on screen are so massive. Like those massive set pieces are so impressive and so different than, you know, what I'm seeing on a two and a half by three and a half trading card. So I was very blown away with what's happening. And I kind of remember, oh, this is, this is that one little shot that I did see from the thing, but I had completely misunderstood most of it. And, you know, looking back now, I remember a couple of the, the the things that I misunderstood at the time. And it's like, wow, I just feel like I was, I was such a dumb kid. Like, how were you such an idiot when you were little? Completely misunderstanding what was happening. And the Empire Strikes Back. Like, what, what, are you such an idiot? But that's, it was such a little slice. And, and I think that's what starts. That's, that's like the perfect age. Because um, this is something else I want to talk to you ladies about. Is nostalgia. Um, it's a perfect age for nostalgia is like 10 to 12 year olds, at least for boys. Um, when you find a thing that you really strikes you and it really bowls you over and like it, it, your mind has that moment where it's like broadened to like, there's this whole thing um, that really blows away and you, you get attached really quickly to it. And so I've had conversations with other friends. One of my friends is a huge baseball fan. I don't really get baseball. Like I like some sports, but baseball is not really one of them. But in talking to him, um, his parents got divorced. And so his dad had visitation and he and his dad, they lived down in San Francisco and they would go see Giants games. And like getting to be there, be on the field, you understand. And, and like, he's explaining the same thing as me explaining the first time seeing an ad at or ATAT on the giant screen. And he's explaining it with the same wonder and whimsy. And it's because you were that 10 to 12, you're, you're old enough to understand certain things, but you're not jaded enough that the world seems so small anymore. You can still really have these fantastical mind opening moments. And so he's really attached to the giants and baseball because of that. That's the moment that I was like into trading cards and, um reading newsprint comics and so i'm like very into like old comics and trading cards and things from that era because that stuff really blew me away and i was spending late nights you know flipping through the cards or watching i had just a black and white television in my room watching the universal monsters movies you know when i'm supposed to already be in bed that has such a special memory and i can't really blow myself away that way anymore you know you don't have an experience that is so overwhelming when you're 48 <laughs> usually you know when you're a kid this stuff is so important to thinking you about it like i've got a big thing about teenage mutant ninja turtles and i think part of it is i remember coming home from school and i remember it was on on a thursday and i used to run home from school to watch it and we grew up very poor. We didn't really have that, you know, we weren't bought things a lot, put it that yep. way. Um, but my mum, every week, she bought me my Turtles comic. And it was no. like every Thursday I'd come home from school, there'd be my Turtles comic and Turtles would be on the telly. And, you know, and it's still so special to me now. I still can't stop collecting Turtles stuff. It's ridiculous. And that's what I love. That's That's where, like, nostalgia, like, that's that first seed of nostalgia. And so I, the people that are still into it, you know, now in our forties or fifties or, or, you know, somebody of this generation that has collected things for 20, 25, 30 years. I, in talking to a number of people that collect stuff or who are in somehow entertainment, 
it was that age. There's something about like nine to 12 and you get like locked into this experience, blowed me away, blew me away. And I'm trying to recapture that same sense of wonder, that same experience that I had at that age. And I think that anybody that really is into collecting, it touches that, it fires those same neurons again. You know, you, we were talking about having a psychologist on um, in the future. And so this is kind of what I want to throw out there in advance for that. Is, is that, is that, what, is there a phenomenon or a psychology to something about the ages of like nine to 12, your formative years, you don't feel like you really own anything. It's especially like you said, Lindsay, um, somebody didn't have as much stuff. I didn't, we did fine. We weren't poor, poor, but in the community that we lived in, we were not one of the wealthy families, you know? So it felt like sometimes you're scrapping and like, I got to hold on another nine months to a birthday before I get, you know, something new or something. But if you get, if you're able to pull together 50 cents and you buy your comic or you buy your trading card or you go to the library and you find a new like trade comic of comic strips for me. Like, I, you know, I remember the day that I found the old uh, Buck Rogers with a giant volume, the same thing. And I remember that day vividly because I'd never seen that art before. It was so highly detailed. It was, I remember staring for hours at the inking and the line work and appreciating that. And it, it, that was so formative. I'm not going to have that experience necessarily at 48. I'm just sort of trying to tie back into that emotional experience that I had back then. And so everything that I'm doing now with a trading card company ties back to that love that I had. That's you know. exactly what I wanted to ask you is that, because that, obviously you, you have a massive respect and, and love of, of collecting and the emotions that you had when you, when you managed to collect the things that you were really after when you were that age. And I, I, I'm going to maybe guess that this trading card company is maybe a way for you to try to get those feelings back. Could that possibly be, or to at least maybe offer it to someone else? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, you know, that, that conversation with Richard was like, why don't you do that? Because that's your passion. And, and that made me sort of think like, what is my passion? What is it about this particular experience I was having with his mystery science theater, collecting all of those um, promo cards that were from sketch cards? And what it was is I connected very, I connected very specifically with that artwork. And um, <clears throat> so then, when the time came to do my own sets, what I try very specifically to do is. Um, I'm looking at style and, and, and trying to figure out what really fires an artist themselves up because it's great to get maybe somebody that has notoriety or somebody that's like a really realistic or this or that. But for me, you know, I've wound up doing two drive-in double features, which could be considered low budget, let's say horror, you know, it's, it's more in that genre. Well, I don't necessarily I want, I'm yeah. sorry. It was the Ape and White Zombie you did. The well, Ape and White Zombie was, was Drive-In Double Feature Series 1, and Series 2 was Night of the Living Dead and The Last Man on Earth. So do you and like... So, are, are you a big horror fan? Or is it just I, sort of gone that way? I like older horror. I'm not, I, I'm not against modern horror, but I'm not necessarily into some of the real torture. I'm, I'm not as into gore. I'm into the psychological elements of horror. So like the original Halloween is so much scarier to me seeing someone being stalked or the psychology of somebody who is relentlessly coming after you than I am seeing somebody who, you know, gets their <laughs> entrails pulled out through whatever orifice. <laughs> I remember when I watched first watched Saw and I was like, well, the first one was all right because it was a bit, oh, I didn't know, you know. But, but all the ones after that, you're just like, this is not... Well, there's, there still is some great stuff that's being produced right now, but it doesn't necessarily... It needs to really have like some of the psychological elements or to be, to be honest, the ones that I really connect with are the ones that um, the monster is always us, where it mm. turns out that, you know, the creature... you whatever your creature, whatever your monster, whatever your villain is, um, if they're just, if they're just an out and out monster, it's not terribly satisfying. But if you find 
that they have some compassion or sympathy. I love the creature from the Black Lagoon. The, the guy was just in his own element, doing his own thing. And these people come in and he sees this woman and he's never seen this before. And he's fascinated and he plays off of like, I'm, I wanna get just close enough and I can't quite touch her. And there's so many scenes where he's trying to and he's this and he's that and he's conflicted. And then you see that the human beings that are going in there and they're setting off grenades in the water, killing all of the fish. Like the humans are the villains of that movie if you look at it the right way. Or Did you enjoy uh, the X-Files at all? Sorry, I, your life is Richard. I want, I want to tell you this little story. Can I tell you my little story? So yeah. um, when I was a kid, I watched Ghostbusters. And you'd think, I mean, try and guess the bit I found scariest in that movie. You won't be able to guess it. Um, <laughs> it was when, you know, he's being chased by the, the demon dog. Oh, and he, that is he runs up to that restaurant and he's banging on the window. Yeah. <laughs> And everyone ignores him. Like that terrified me half to death. I was like, this guy needs help. Nobody's yeah. helping him. That was the scariest yeah. bit of Ghostbusters for me. And I've never forgotten it. I was like, why? <laughs> but so yeah. it's definitely the psychological stuff has so much more of an effect, well, on me personally. And I'm yeah, and that's why something like I do I do really skew towards some of the zombie stuff because again, that has so much so uh societal sociological like context to it because again usually some yes there's this zombie apocalypse but usually the worst things that you come across are other humans who are so disengaged that they're taking advantage of other people they're murdering other people for their goods they're they're doing these things where you're seeing how people are dragging each other down and mm -hmm. that stuff is so much, that is what's so fascinating like to me about those films. You're, you're actually a fan of storytelling in, underneath it all. Y Absolutely, you're more of a yeah. fan of storytelling than you are really of the special effects, which are cool and all, but if there's no story, it isn't gonna speak to you. Yeah, not really. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of, yeah, summing it up. And that's again why, you know, I've, I have as much a love for comic books as I do trading cards or something like that because yeah if, if a story is really well told and visually comic books are really interesting because i think and it's they get the same rap too oh this is just stuff for kids um and i want to ask you ladies about that too because i think it might be a slightly different conception maybe in canada and the uk than it is in the us um but yeah, the, like a comic book can have a really well told and a really well crafted story, or it can have a garbage story. Which one's going to be interesting? You know, more interesting to read. If it has really nice artwork, that's great. But is it really saying anything? And I think you were sort of asking like, what speaks to me about doing my own trading cards? And that's part of the answer. Is uh, part of my process, and again, why it takes me so long to do this. I'm looking at artists' work and trying to see who really is saying something and who is really saying something that's in the same vein as this. You know, when I when I first announced that I was doing a Night of the Living Dead trading card set, there were plenty of people who popped out of the woods. This is my favorite movie ever, but their style didn't really click with anything that was there, you know? And so I, when I'm trying to first work with an artist, I start asking them, I don't ask them, how much is your rate? Or how many, can we do this? Can we do that? What's your schedule? The first thing I want to ask them is, is like, what did you like about this movie? Is there a scene that you really connected with? Because um, that's been one of the trickier things I've found working with, you know, working with usually somewhere around 40 artists per series. And I don't want seven cards that are the same photo reference of the same character doing the same thing. I want a mix up of it. And I want a mix up of people too. Somebody, you know, thinks that it's a, a there's somebody who's a really good cartoonist and he thought that it was really great to do these weird wonky like zombies. And that's what really struck it. That's fantastic. Somebody was really blown away that Karen murdered his, her own mother when she became a zombie. And I talked about why was that scary? Why was that horrific? Some people want to be like, Oh, well, I want to do like something that like covers the, the, the whole like society or something big. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to really gauge artists what their connection with is it with the movie is and then what can they bring to that card and i'm trying to do that 40 different times with 40 different artists never have it, anything cross over i'm making this way harder than it has to be you know i it'd be easier to just hire 40 artists or honestly to hire 10 artists to do 
four cards each and I could get this thing done and wrapped in a month. But I spend so much more time because I, I think, and for me, I see it. And I hope that other people, when they look through my set, they really see that each person is bringing something totally different to the exact same material. And I want, you know, you're not going to connect with all of them. They're not all going to be the best pieces or they're not going to necessarily speak to you. But I really feel like throughout the course, different artists will say different things and something will speak. If you have a love for this movie or if you have a love for Sasquatch, I think that you're going to not just connect to the material. You're going to connect with what the artist is saying through their work about the material. And that's what I spend some time on. Too. So you, you've mentioned Sasquatch. I'm I'm guessing then we can mention that you know you you're you're working on on a Sasquatch set. This would be I think what the fourth set that you as a company are putting out. The yes, I did the uh, three third solely on my own, and then the fourth uh, if you uh, consider Nosferatu, which I did with Richard at RR Parks and Jeremy at uh, Attic and Lindsay. I get to say is uh, going to join us for the second series. We've just announced Lindsay's coming in and it's going to be a uh, four producer set uh, for the sequel. That's awesome. But what's your, what's your, um, what's, what's the story that you're going to try to tell with the, with the, uh, with this particular set? With Sasquatch or, yes. or with no school? Well, both of them. I'd, if you, if you have the chance, I'd love to know what, what the story is behind. Like because I get the feeling you don't really just want to put out like a bunch of cards, a set, you know, that's just meaningless. You you obviously are putting your heart into this. So what's the story behind that you want to tell with your trading card set of Nosferatu, and what's the story that you want to tell with Sasquatch? I have a feeling that listening to that is going to tell us what we might expect from you down the line. Yeah, so Nosferatu evolved out of, I'd obviously been in talks from the very start with Richard Parks and was talking, we've been talking about different projects. He had already put aside, uh, he, he purchased some 35 millimeter film and had made film cell cards and he and Jeremy were planning on doing a Nosferatu set. And I was looking to break beyond, I'd done a uh, drive-in double feature one and two and I, that's sort of now established. It's like a thing that's expected. I'm working on series three now of that set, but I needed something slightly different um, to be like a new set of my own. And I said, I have this vision of stuff that I want to do about these old classic films. And I want to do it slightly different than just the all art, because I do want to have a story subset that shows the film. And I want to do um, you know, it has like a 3D element that we're turning these old films into 3D. And he's like, you know, you're talking about a set that Jeremy and I are already talking about doing. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So he wrapped me into the fold uh, with Nosferatu. And I took on, since I was so into the artists at the time, I took on the art subset um, of hiring, commissioning artists to do sketch cards. And then um, I built a set of the art the art subset of cards um, from that for Nosferatu. For Nosferatu 2, I'm stepping away from the art because I want to do something different. And um, I don't think, since it's not official, I probably can't say for sure what that's going to be, but I'm I'm taking a very different role for 2 because I don't want to do the same thing twice. And I love the design work you've done for the cards, though. That looks great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's that's definitely the graphic designer part, you know, coming in and, and having to graphic design it up a bit. I wanted in a, in a way for it to really look like some of the old Gothic, the backs have, you know, the skulls with the teeth and and the stonework and the really old scratchy, you know, he has the long talons. So everything has really like sharp, pointy, long, elongated fonts and things like that. I really got into that. And that's fun and then, stuff to draw that. Yeah, and then doing everything in sort of a parchment, um, you know, colorway for, for series one. I've gone with, um, for series two, I watched Nosferatu um, again about six months ago, and it was actually a colorized version, and I'd never seen that before. And they, so they did different colored tints to the film. They did this one purple tint, and when um, Count Orlac was creeping around in this purple tint, it really kind of freaked me out and was really impressive. And so series two, I'm going to use the same design elements, but series two is going to be like in the purples and some real deep lavenders. It was almost blood because there's definitely a reddish purple, 
but I really love the, the, the colors that, that two is going into. And then Sasquatch is a whole other thing. Um, so what is my motivation for Sasquatch? I've lived in the Northwest of the United States for my entire life. And there are rest stops that are Sasquatch, you know, viewpoints. You can see a, a sign that, oh, this is a Sasquatch viewpoint. Like, oh, okay, this is just where you come to stand and watch Sasquatches evidently. Um, when I go down to the beach, there's a Sasquatch themed restaurant. You walk in and there's a giant Sasquatch. In there. So like we're surrounded by some of the mythology and so much to the point where everybody just takes it for granted. Yeah, it's just another Sasquatch thing. Like no big deal. I have Sasquatch on my car. I have Sasquatch on this. And then I started like, you know, thinking we're, we're surrounded in, in the area that I'm in by mountains and trees and just thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of acres of just unknown land like so I wanted to be really respectful and honor the people that are like super hardcore this is a thing we have to discover and the people that are like questioning like is this a thing that's real and so I started doing research and each card is a different encounter that comes directly and I quote the source on the card um, each card is a specific Bigfoot Sasquatch Yeti encounter um, taken from a news or a media source, how they well, reported yeah, who yeah. it was. Oh, and I then, absolutely love that. <laughs> yeah, and so the artists, I, I, I definitely meddled more than I had in the others. The other sets, I wanted them to express themselves. And this, I, I did do a lot more assigning of like, I really need to have, this is, this is about, you know, a footprint in the ice. And so I would talk to, you know, Laura Atkinson about like, do you, is it too weird to have a, a, a card that's just the footprint in the ice? And she's like, I don't know. Let's see what it comes up with. Or, you know, one of the cards addresses one of the Sasquatch. Somebody claimed that they had killed a Sasquatch and that one turned out to be a fake. Now, I don't think that that means that the set says that this, it doesn't invalidate. But could somebody, it in some way that it makes it clear that it was fake. Like the, historically, someone did this fake and I wanted to honor that as well because that is a part of the history is I think a part of it. because uh, I, I was trained as an illustrator so when there's anything that's there's a story that I'm like <laughs> and that's the thing too so again it's how am I telling the story it's all of these different encounters for over 120 over 120 years you know 24 cards covers that and then when I that got real that, that got very for real, you know, it was all of the real, all of the technical. And then sort of at Richard Parks nudging again, he was like, okay, now you're going to have a little fun with this set too. And um, he'd helped me find a, a resource to do lenticular cards where the motion uh, comes in. And one of the things when I was in my teens, I uh, took a class with an animator, a, a guy that was a former Disney animator, and I tried to try out as an animator. So I was able to take one of the artists, um, Sasquatch, and give him this roar animation in seven steps, a lenticular, so that he roars when you move the card back and forth. And, you know, I'm always trying to do the stuff that impresses 12-year-old me. 12-year-old me would have been really impressed by this card. So I think that that was a success. Or... Um, the other one that I was doing, I was trying to find, um, I, I, I got my Sasquatch to help promote. Let's see yeah. him. I got him to help. Oh, uh, that's so photos. awesome. Oh, oh my God. The people who I are listening to the audio, unfortunately, won't be able to see uh, that, but they'll just have to go over to YouTube to check him out. That's just so cool. Oh, wow. That has to be the snapshot for the episode. <laughs> <laughs> have you given him a name? Uh, I, what's that? Have you given him a name or is it a she? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know that I have. Name him today. Why have I named? I don't know. Because usually what happens is my kids name stuff. And then that's what sticks. You know, whatever this kids say goes. That's why my daughter brought Grogu and Grogu had to be over one shoulder and Catbug had to be over the other shoulder because she said that they had to be so cool. Yes. This is why my fish is called Chrysler when you let the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, That's funny. <laughs> so, you know, I was looking for the Sasquatch and, and getting him and on Etsy, somebody was selling these tiny, ridiculously tiny Sasquatches. And I'm like, what am I going to do with that? And then talking to Richard again, Richard is my like, 
pump me up guy. He's like, no, you get him. You throw him in every package. It's a little fun thing. When they open it up, a little Sasquatch falls out and it's going to be great. It's going to be funny. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not quite me. And again, I go very, you know, I'm, I'm very emotional with this stuff. I'm like, that doesn't quite feel like my set of cards. Like even, even though it's fun, just having a thing fall out wasn't my thing. And so I started thinking back, these things are so tiny and so awful and so ridiculous that I had to have them, but I had to do something with them. And so I finally came up with, based on these tiny little Sasquatches, my own action figure. So he's on a little blister card that is vacuum sealed. And it also gives me an opportunity, again, this is all coming back from when I was a kid, you open up the back of the comics and it has all of these ads for these garbage toys. Well, I'm now a garbage toy producer. And so I came up with on the back, a bunch of joke. Oh, that's genius. Other products. That's amazing. So, yeah. So, you know, this is me again. I'm just trying to impress 12 year old me or, or that, that little, that little kid that still lives inside of me. This is my way of like getting all of that stuff out and making this fun and making it interesting. And nobody's going to do a set of cards, you know, the way that I do it. Nobody would do a set of cards the way you do them. And so I think that's, what's so interesting. And, and, you know, Richard says he always invites anybody to the table that's a small person because they're going to say something. The, the, the big companies are, are there to make the money and they have the giant licenses and we're out there to do our piece and to have our fun and to communicate because our little piece of the world too. Because you're a smaller company, you're able to maybe uh, take, the, take the chance and do the sets that others might not either want to do or be able to do. I, th I think it's great. I've said it before and I say it again. The big companies and the little companies, it's all simpatico and it works together in its own weird way. I think it's yeah. genius what you're doing with, uh, with that. That's fabulous. Uh, that's, yeah, I mean, it, it has to reflect who you are because if I'm going to do this and I'm going to put all of this time and, you know, risk so far, everything's covered itself. I haven't had any flops that have, you know, cost me anything it hasn't put me back and so i've been fortunate in that regard and so i keep I, I think for me the biggest thing is to to be as true as i can to myself and put out the stuff that interests me and i keep finding my audience of people that are like-minded i i struggle with every now and then you know some people have a comment of like well you should really do things this way or you should really have it this or, or more people might come to the table and purchase things if you did things this way but it's it has to be, it has to mesh and it has to be something that I really connect with. And then I think that the people who have connected with me are going to really recognize that if I'm doing something just to bring a couple extra bucks in, I mean, every now and then you have to compromise and make sure you're funding yourself. But for the most part, I want to do it my way and I want to make my own statement. And that's the part that's how I've gotten this far is saying the things that I wanted to say about something. Oh, you have to be yourself, don't you? Yeah. And it's taken a long time. I mean, it's taken a long time for me to be that comfortable with myself. Again, this is a, probably maybe another question for your psychologist, you know, the, so many, so many of us that are collectors or are doing this stuff were awkward kids who didn't really have a place, but then we did find a community. Maybe it was the comic book community, or maybe it was, we connected with these cards or collecting and, the people who had troubles connecting with other people when they were young, they do finally come into their own. And I'm now finally comfortable with myself and finally like good with where I'm at to the point where I can say, no, this is how I want to make things. And I think that took a really long journey, but that's part of being a collector too, is feeling like you're an outsider and wanting to connect with something and when you do connect with something, you want all of it. <laughs> so you, you very likely had issues of self-doubt as a youngster, because I think I would hazard to say that most of us who are in this weird world of illustration and producing and all that had, I mean, as you just said, that's why you are who you are and why you're producing. So how have you managed to get over those issues of self-doubt well enough to put yourself out there to actually produce something that's a big step from being some from being a little kid who was like maybe insecure shy whatever to now being actually someone who's producing something well it's not a quick process i mean i'm 48 and i'm only producing my fourth set of cards <laughs> it takes a while to get that comfortable with yourself i i think 
in talking to some people, I've tried and failed at so many different things that um, I finally found what I'm good at. And I don't mind understanding that I'm good at that. And then you, as you go through life, people fall by the wayside that aren't necessarily the people that connect to your core values. And so what you end up having is you connect more and more and more with people who are like-minded, people who do prop you up, who, people who are supportive of you. Um, and then in your work, you find, when you've found something that is truly, you know, it, it takes a lot of introspection of like, is this something that I'm truly connected with? I was fortunate that over 10 years ago, I connected with somebody um, and he was just on the verge of starting a magazine and needed a designer. And I had a scanner and lived across the hall from him. So I had a fortune of meeting him at just the right time, but he and I clicked on so many of our values and I felt such a confidence. And now 10 years in, that's only built my confidence. We've, we've published a magazine for over 10 years. And that- Is that full bleed? Because I, I went on your page earlier and I was having a nosy around and you've done- Full bleed, I've bleed. done for about two years, uh, Back Issue magazine, the comic book um, the, about comics from the 60s, 70s and 80s. And now, now that we've done it for 10 years, we get to start rolling the 90s in, uh, 90s comics as well. But yeah, so that's Back Issue. you started? I'm working on issue 138 right now of back issues. So we've done it for a little bit um, and it just keeps going. It, there's obviously something there. I mean, I, look, I saw the, uh, the cover of the latest one and it looks amazing. I love the artwork. Yeah, it's, it's great. And it's, you know, you, it's, it's like any art. I, if you guys were to look at, back at something that you drew 10 years ago, it would be cringeworthy. If I look back at the early issues, that's the same thing. I was, I was trying to really impress people with my graphics and boom and do stuff, this and that. And, and the first 30 issues or so, it started taking a lot of conversations of like, let's make sure this is readable as possible and that it reads smoothly because when you turn a page to something that's so chaotic, it interrupts what the author's trying to say. So now I have to be mindful of the writer and the writer's content and how do I communicate that? So, I mean, all of this is communication, trading cards, somebody doing sketch card art, they're trying to communicate things in a magazine and uh, uh, the writer's written something. And so how do I best allow them to communicate without interfering, but still make it look cool. When you look to the first page, it should be like, oh, wow, this is a really interesting article. And the, the design should actually draw you in to the written material versus it be difficult for you to, you know, be able to extract like, what's even going on. And, you know, at first as a young designer, I tried to really be impressive because that's how you think you impress people. Then you don't understand that that's interfering with some of the communication and some of the message too. It's the same with art. I mean, when I, I'm, I'm quite well known for doing a lot of different styles now, but this, this is why. It's because when I was younger, I didn't have enough confidence in what just came out naturally. So I practice yeah. this style, practice that style. I mean, it, it's helped me now, but since I've been start, started doing stuff that comes naturally, like I've been doing really well. So it's like, as soon as you just learn to accept who you are and that you can you can try and do this. I do it's think it's useful to, to maybe copy other styles too when you're a young kid and all that. It, it teaches you the basics and then you go do your own. Where you just take that plunge and just do it and just think, right, I need to have enough confidence in myself just to, just yeah. to do what comes naturally and see what happens. Well, and I think as somebody who did art at one point and now what I do is art with a completely different tool. I mean, designing is a very different tool than like a hand you know, done tool, but I'm, I'm still, I still have an appreciation for it because I did do it at one point. And like you said, Ingrid, copy, when you don't have a style, copying someone else's style is very tempting. And it's a way to like, feel like you have a thing, but that's, it, it leads from a lack of confidence. But I think technically you're right. As far as like learning how, like, if you've never done brushes before, if you look at like, Walt Kelly's pogo and you tried to copy what he's doing. No, I don't think you want to ultimately try to have his style five years from now. There are things you're going to learn 
about your hand-eye coordination and the way that the, the brush works and inking and trying to like get things to move to the foreground versus the background or lights and darks, um, line weight, all of that, if you look at that in copying that, I think technically you're learning things, but it's not necessarily you want to adopt that style. So there, there's, I know there's a huge stigma for quote copying or copying someone's style or emulating somebody else's style. And so I think that's, that's early on a great thing to do, but not necessarily a great thing to do as far as you're putting yourself out as this is my style now. When it's you're a great kid, you, it's natural when you're a kid. I mean, yeah. I think you're born wanting to copy, whether it's, whether it's with a pencil or a, an activity or anything, you, you're born, you, you're a sponge. You're supposed to do what other people do around you. Okay, kids like, emulate. You know, that's what you do. So you copy and you do all that stuff. And as you grow yeah. up, you, you learn all those things. But then yeah. I do just said you, you can't kind of keep doing it and try to pass it off as your, as your own. You, you copy right. to learn. Then you have to learn to... When I, when I used to ride horses and stuff like this, this all ties in, spent years and years and years being taught by teachers and, and also learning by watching other people, how they would ride and how they would do things, how they would try techniques and all that. And then finally, I was like, how come I can't seem to think independently? Well, someone one day told me, you have to spend some time away from the teachers and not look at anybody else and just do it on your own and have the confidence to know that you can deal with whatever's going to happen and and you're going to you're going to develop your own style and you'll learn the confidence of independence and then to be able to put it out there and it was one of the best little things i ever learned and yeah. I could apply it to my own artwork and i'm still learning how to do that but that was like one of the biggest lessons i ever learned learning yeah confidence Go ahead. Confidence, and self confidence, and self confidence really for anybody that has any sort of artistic bent is something that's. I mean, everybody, every artist deals in some way with the imposter syndrome. So you try to overcompensate for things, and you try to do things that aren't necessarily true to you. And I think, you know, the three of us are in an age now where we probably all are saying, every time I tried to do something that wasn't me, it didn't come from my core, it didn't really hit all of my who I was you were straying from that and it may have impressed somebody, but what it didn't do was, you know, bring you the things that are closer to yourself or your values. The more you can find out, and I don't know if it's for some people, it's meditation, for some it's trial and error, for some people like me, it's a lifelong, you know, lesson of just figuring out what you are and aren't as close to. And eventually that stuff boils down to really who you are. And then that gives you that sense of confidence of like, no, you know what? Anybody that doesn't like my style, that's fine. You're nobody. There's no artist. The best artists that are out there, they're people that hate their work. You, you have to be as true to what your work is. And then that appeals to your audience and just embrace and, and know what your audience is. And if, if somebody out there isn't as into your art, they just don't connect with you. And that's okay. You're not going to have, you're not going to bull everybody over that, that sees your artwork. There's going to be some people that don't necessarily connect with that. And that's okay. That's not your person. Not everybody has to be your person. <laughs> and that's, I think, one of the hard things too for artists is they want every publisher to think that they want them. And some it might not click for. Some it's just not their taste. Or some it's not their aesthetic. Or some it's, it, it's not. Or for me, I try to give most people that approach me, if we talk about it and it feels like we're clicking, I try to give them a chance. But for me, there are people who don't understand why I, have, I haven't used them in a couple of projects. It, their style or their aesthetic or things that are going on for them, it just doesn't click with the project. And I would love for us to work together, but it's not the right project. And I don't wanna put you on something that you're not putting your right foot forward. I would like you to have a different project that is setting you up for success and you are, you know, you're saying the right things and it's communicating and you're going to have a more fulfilling experience than thinking, okay, now this is a project. I've got to figure out how do I do this? Well, do I, does he want this kind of style or do I need to change things? Anytime you're trying to change yourself to impress or to be, you know, what somebody else is asking you to do as an artist, you're doing the wrong thing. You need to find what's your way 
of speaking and being a part of that project and how are you communicating what comes straight for you? Your best pieces come when they come without effort because you're literally, you're, you're glowing the subjects. What would be your dream set that you would produce? Uh, okay, I, this comes with a bit of a preamble. I've done all but one of my sets have not been licensed sets. Um, because the way I structured my company is I had enough money. I had 400 bucks put aside at one point um, to commission enough artists to do a promo set and to get a bunch of sketch cards. Then that funded me doing drive-in double feature. When I, when that set, that sets money, I rolled over into drive-in double feature one. All of drive-in double feature one's money rolled into two. And so I'm getting a slightly bigger and bigger, but I'm not to the point where I can really license anything because most licenses are recognizable at all. It's eight, 10, $15,000. And that's just to license the material before you're talking about hiring artists, before you're talking about uh, producing the cards, printing costs, distribution, any of that, you're talking about having to have 10 to $15,000 upfront, or you just go and here, now I've just maxed out this credit card. Uh, to, to license a set. And that's, I'm very big on, I bootstrapped my company from the get-go. I've put aside the money ahead of time for all of my commissions for the next set. I commission that set while I'm kickstarting and the profits from that Kickstarter, maybe sometimes I get a couple bucks out of it. For the most part, it rolls into the next and that's how I build the next set. And that's how I'm building bigger and bigger sets and able to commission more artists every time. So, what are my dream projects? Probably a licensed set, but I don't know financially if I could ever afford that. I put in an inquiry to the Planet of the Apes people because I would love to do a set that is not a photo set. It is an artist set of Planet of the Apes. Um, five different subsets from the original five films, a couple films from maybe the Timber or newer stuff, but like for the most part, really, the original films Planet of the Apes was such a huge um, movie for me. You know, I'm never going to, I can't tell you, Oh, I'm going to get, I, I'd love to get the star Wars license and do something with it. But honestly, yeah. I would like to get a star Wars license. Why would I like to get that? Because I would like to do something very different than what's happening. Um, and that's not to slam well, on what's you happening. Know, you never know, because I mean, uh, there are so many, uh, so many different outshoots that are coming from that, that I mean, yeah. you know, I'm sure not one company can handle the whole thing. And uh, it is it? mostly coming from one company though. Um, so but I would love to do an art, again, I would like to do it in more of an artistic, when, um, when the art set of cards in the 90s came out that was Star Wars, I would love to do more in that or like explore more of like the Hildebrandt sets or when, do you remember in the 90s when like Boris Vallejo did his set and entirely well, like- Can I can I just interject here? I'm sorry, yeah. I, I try not to talk and all that stuff. You're fine, we're talking. When you mentioned <laughs> you mention Greg Hildebrandt and, and uh, Boris Vallejo and all that, Way, yes. way, way, way back when there used to be a series of magazines called Starlog Magazines. Oh, yeah. I devoured each and every one of those magazines. I still have a bunch of them. As it, and you had uh, Boris Valio and then his wife, Doris, yep. I think, who ended up being being uh, on it. I would study those paintings like crazy. Uh, you had uh, the Hildebrands. You had... Um, Oh gosh, I'm, I'm so ashamed that I forget all they they were supportive of artists and they had so many different painters and 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 inkers and comic book artists and all that stuff. Oh, it was just delicious all the stuff they had. And I'm sorry, please go on. I had Yeah, to... no, that's no, I mean that's that's exactly it. See anything like that 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 ties into your love. That's exactly what to talk about. So yeah, a, a dream set would be maybe to do one of these big sets, but to do it sort of my way. Like universal sets have been done a number of times. Even in the 90s, there was the set that was done um, through the Dark Horse artists and things like that. But I would love to do my take on the universal or my take on the hammer. Planet of the Apes is one that I'm big on. Um, you know, these are giant licenses. So this is like super far from what I'm really able to do. So that's definitely like a dream project that's way down the line. Um, I have two 
smaller projects that may be a lot closer to being able to do. So one of the first sets that I collected um, was called Defective Comics. And it was this guy that did these fantastic parodies of classic comic book covers. And so um, it was in this really funny, super over-exaggerated, almost like a Fred Hembeck style um, where he did, and I would love to expand on a set like that or to do a comedy Mad Magazine satire set. The other thing I would like to do, and I'm a lot closer, so I have to be a little bit careful how I say this, but um, I have a lot of respect for the people who are super into Garbage Pail Kids and the wacky packages. And I am currently developing a thing. So everything is about branding right now. Like the reason I do drive-in double feature instead of a white zombie, or I did a uh, drive-in double feature two instead of Night of the Living Dead set is a way to brand it. I put two films together that make sense as if they would be done. They're, they're done they're within just a couple of years of each other. So they could have been shown at a drive-in theater. They could have played together on the same playbill. The, the films are similar in context. And then um, so that they look similar and, and have a very similar aesthetic when the card set comes out. And for drive-in double feature three, I want to put like a little like torn ticket stub and a little popcorn bag is what all of this is going to come in. And so like it starts to have all of the experience of going to a double feature as well. And so it starts to add to that, you know, if just think if I can get the popcorn smell somehow in the bag or something like that. But so everything's about branding. And so Garbage Pail Kids is a genius way to parody so many things. And I am trying to figure out quite how to, I have a, an idea for a set that would be a parody set along the lines of Garbage Pail Kids, but it would parody um, things that are in pop culture and entire film franchises and things like that. So it would be my character but parodying that, if that makes sense. That's about all I can really say without wow. <laughs> spilling any beans. I would get back that to 15 years ago. I had a little character called Funny Cat and, and the idea was Funny Cat can be anything. I could make yeah. him a film character or he'd be a settee or he'd be a rug or he'd be just whatever, as long as it had this little face on it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's the part of branding is how is it recognizably yours? And so I'm, I... I have a name and I have a look and it, even that look is parodying something itself. Like all of the Garbage Pail Kids, you immediately recognize and know. Not only do you know this is a Garbage Pail Kids, but you know that it's parodying the Cabbage Patch Kids. But it's not only parodying the Cabbage Patch Kids, but they could be parodying Freddy Krueger because it's the Garbage Pail Kid is Freddy Krueger. So it like works on a number of levels, but getting that consistency of art and sort of marrying and figuring out with the right set of artists it's a lot trickier i think you're a bit uh, lucky in the u.s as well um with you know copyright law and things like that i think it's a little more relaxed in the u.s than it is in europe yeah like we, we can do barely anything we would like oh, you know, really? mad magazine we wouldn't be able to do that oh it, that's super interesting so they can't do as many parodies no not in europe no it, it's hey, uh, so with a question, and I'm probably not even answering Ingrid's question because I'm so far removed from what that question was. <laughs> I've trailed off at this point. So one thing I wanted to ask you is I'm in the United States and we have a Canadian and we have a Brit from the UK. I think that those three are three different markets or at least three different ways that people perceive trading cards as well. I think in the United States, trading cards are looked at at least had been a lot like comics this is stuff for kids it's lowbrow it's disposable and so i feel like it's hard for artists from the u.s to get a lot of respect and why most artists still probably put themselves out as i'm a sketch comic book cover artist but i guess i'll do some trading cards too even if trading cards are their love is that different in canada and i know that it's definitely a little different than that in the UK because like there's a long history of trading cards all the way back to like cigarette cards and different things like that where I feel like card artists aren't nearly looked at in the same way as maybe they are in the US. Have you heard, you of, them, have you heard of them being called ACEOs? Artists, oh. 
artist art card editions and originals okay. um when i first discovered them it was about mid 2000s and okay. uh, it was just kind of just starting to blow up but that's what they're called over at aceos if it's original artwork so okay. i think the original artwork does okay but for printed stuff i'm not sure how well that kind of stuff sells i know for your big names it does but It'd be nice to get people to be aware that they can be for adults as well. I mean, it's it's collectible artwork, really, isn't it? Yeah. Whether it's print oh, or, it's, or original. Here, like, it, here yeah. in, in uh, Quebec, it's, except for Montreal, Montreal, there is a very, 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 very small community of, of sketch card artists. There, Well, I mean, I think there may be two that I am aware of. And I think there was one in, in the city of Quebec and all of Canada. Well, I think, I think there are actually a few now. There are more and uh, more than I had thought, actually. The, the artist, uh, Robert Taranishi, who does sketch cards, he's actually in Manitoba, if I'm not mistaken. So that was something I was not aware of. Uh, but otherwise, it's the reason why I started writing the books here, putting them to not writing them, but putting them together and all that, because it's virtually unknown here. And yes, uh, Lindsay, a CEO, that really was the uh, the origin of uh, it merged with with trading cards from what I've learned over the past couple of years. You had your sketch cards, which were kind of taken aboard with tops and stuff like that. And maybe a few things before, I think it was FLIR or something like that. Um, but ACEOs were, uh, were the beginning and normally that they were not bought or sold. They were traded. You would create your own little card and you'd buy them and sell them. You'd, I mean, uh, trade them, not buy them and sell them. My, my bad. But now of course they've completely become something else once they became on, once they, they got on board with the, uh, with major sets like from tops and stuff like that but they're not really very well known here so in it, it when i came on board the whole thing it was all in the us way back in 2006 five six it was all in the states i didn't know that there was mm. something like that anywhere else to answer your question so interesting yeah i just i know you know it, it's already easy enough like we said the imposter syndrome is already hard enough but i think that it's somehow perceive that it's it, it's one thing or the other it's either stuff that oh this is just like stuff for little kids especially the base sets or things like that or it's something that's just a collector's market and so you have to like you have to try to be one of the high-end artists to, to to really feel like you know you're you're a success or a i feel like there's a lot of pressure on it and it, it, it's really hard to sort of come into your own and like we were saying be comfortable with being the artist that you want to be because there's a lot of pressure on satisfying the companies on satisfying the customers on you know retaining a certain value of your card or different things like that it, there's a lot going on and it's i don't know i really i really empathize with that it's also hard because you have to try to make a living at it i mean it's a dull fact of life but it, you know you got to try to make a living at whatever it is that you do at least to be able to pay the bills and uh, so, yeah, that adds a little bit of a stress to whatever you do. Would you want to go back to being a quote unquote nine to fiver person? After uh, I don't know that I could. I would be pretty bad probably at it right now. I, I didn't realize how well I would take to. I was I was terrified in, in 2016 when that studio closed. You know, I had a very specific set of skills and it was terrifying to think. Uh, I don't know, you know, am I going to find another photographer and just work Photoshop or how do I, you know, <clears throat> so I think I was very fortunate that, that he recognized my skills and a few other people I was able to quickly um, start doing graphic design and picking up some work from then it nine to five. I, I mean, I'm intentionally, I intentionally am starting to turn down or put off work that feels more like the nine to five work and intentionally take, <coughs> excuse me, and take more um, creative work or at least work that inspires me more. So I'm starting to, to get closer, you know, to that, that it would feel like a real step backwards. Now, you know, COVID the last couple of years, it's, it's been harder. It's been, 
Has it affected your job? Your, your work? Yeah, because photographers, um, they had to shut down most of their shoots for over a year with everything shutting down. So I had, I had much less retouch work and retouch work pays better than the other design work or trading cards. Um, and so I had less work from there. I managed to actually have more work because luckily I was able to, um, people, more people were at home writing books, writing magazines. I was able to do, I've worked on a few other people's Kickstarters designing materials for them. Um, and so some of that work picked up, but it doesn't pay as well. So it was a little, it was a little rockier. And I think we felt that a little, and it got a little scary at a couple points. And so the thought is, you know, what do I do? Do I need to, you know, supplant this with a bit of a nine to five job, but I, if I had to, for my family, if it meant my family having a roof over my head and the kids eating, yes, I would go back to a nine to five. Would I be happy? And would that really line up with who I am anymore? Not really. I've seen what I can do now and I've had the response and it wouldn't be nearly as fulfilling. And I would definitely struggle a lot more with it. I would do it if it, if it needed to be, but I feel like I'm sort of on a path now and it, it would be, it would be turning back and, and walking away from something that I'm really starting to have some success and, and really feel like I'm gaining uh, momentum at. That would so be tough to go back now. When is Sasquatch going to be out? Sasquatch is currently on Kickstarter, depending on when this uh, podcast comes out. So it is early April. Uh, it ends, I think, April 30th or 29th, whatever that Friday night is. Well, we're, uh, we're going to include links to your Kickstarter in the uh, in the description box below, and, and Ooh, all love of it. the the all the Thank notes you. and all that stuff. So you're gonna you're gonna give us the the links to all of that. Either we'll absolutely give you links. I can even give you some images if you're able to throw those in in anywhere. Um, so yeah, that ends in at the end of April. Um, there are a couple materials that still need to be produced. Most of it I actually have on hand. Uh, but there are a couple things that are going to need to be produced after that. So it's going to deliver. I'll start shipping end of May. So people will probably be seeing it in June. Uh, but as soon as I close on Sasquatch, I'm very going hard at Drive-In Double Feature 3. Uh, and the two films that are going to be featured for Drive-In Double Feature 3 are The Satanic Rites of Dracula, starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and Horror Express, Starring Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. <laughs> that sounds so. Those films went really together. Well, <clears throat> well, this is that. That sounds absolutely incredible. We're going to start wrapping this up. Sure. Um, this has been amazing. I wish you all the best of luck with everything. I mean, I don't see anything but success uh, for all of these these sets. I, I can't well, wait to see you there. <laughs> no, I. I, I still, you know, we've talked about self-confidence and I felt like Sasquatch might be my first flop. So I've been very, I've been very fortunate and very happy that I've been proven wrong uh, in that regard. So uh, yeah, it, as a way of starting to move off, I have Driving Double Feature uh, 3 coming up. My son and I, my son helped me procure um, artists and he talked about who he wanted. And uh, so I'm trying to start getting him thinking about this, he chose, uh, we watched the film, the silent film Vampire is a film that I, uh, when I was a film student, it's a, it's, most people claim that it's the first vampire film because it's the first time that someone is sucking someone else's life force. Uh, so it's pre-Dracula. Um, and we did a set of cards. Uh, I have half of the cards printed. The other half we're gonna print with Drive-In Double Feature 3. That'll be, probably uh, running at about Halloween. So I'm actually trying to get the next generation of cards um, going. And that's, uh, okay, we're wrapping up and now I have more stuff to say. Oh, so a little bit. <laughs> so the thing, another thing that I think a lot about right now, um, a lot of people who are interested in these sets are people in their forties, more like their fifties and sixties, because that's what we were collecting when we were young. And one of the things, and if putting this out there to you guys, because this is the other thing too, is sort of how to wrap 
the younger generation in. I was listening to the Richard Parks um, one last night, and you guys talking so much about NFTs and things that the younger generation is into. And the thing that I struggle with is this generation is so into digital things or things that don't really exist. They're not tangible. Part of what was so exciting about trading cards was I remember what the waxy pack felt like. I held them. The, the coating on the front, but the backs were just the, the bare cardboard. That stuff is so tactile and so real. And so I'm trying to find ways to interest younger people. I'm bringing my son in. Some other people are having some ideas. And I want ultimately to have what will probably really fail because it's aimed at younger people. I want to find a younger um, series or a younger brand of something that would get them interested in these again and sort of bring back the one of the happiest things that came out of COVID is people started getting interested in sports cards again. They couldn't have sports. They started collecting sports cards. Sports cards went through the roof because they wanted sports again and they wanted to hold something in their hand and physically connect and touch to something again. And that, you know, my whole life right now is propelled by nostalgia and nostalgia for stuff that I had at a certain age. And I want that for them too, because I'm worried about, it, it sounds really dumb, but I am honest to God, worried about the generation that's growing up right now when they're 25, 35, and they look back and they're like, I remember X in my youth. Is it going to be an app? Is it going to be a YouTube link? Like, oh, I remember watching these memes. Like, I don't think that there's the same things that this generation's connecting to. And so they're not going to have, I think that there's some formidable, you know, that really formed and shaped my life. And I was, I'm so much more creative for being into those things and interested in those. And maybe video games are the thing. People will be like, oh, I remember playing that video game and there'll be nostalgia for that. And that's what propels them forward or something like that. But I, I think there is still something physical that I want to find this generation to, to connect with. And that's what's going to keep things alive 30, 50 years from now, because at some point our generation that's collecting all of this stuff is not going to be here. And who is that interested beyond us? You know, it could be kind of cool to, because I think you're right, you know, uh, like I have, well, my kids are adults now, but the things they connected to, there are a few books and comics that they I know they would be nostalgic, nostalgic yeah. for, but you know, it's mostly the video games and some of the, some of the YouTube things, some of the, this and that, but it could be kind of cool to create a trading card set based on stuff that doesn't exist. That's a thing, you know, that could yeah, and that's be a thing. Fun. Yeah. I know that this is something that I do think a lot about. It's like, what are they really connecting to? And so, you know, one of my friends is like, thinks I'm an insane person because my older kids that are no longer in the house, uh, I used to let them play with my Migos, which if anybody knows what Amigo is, it's a little nine inch action figure, but it had like cloth clothes and stuff like that. And we used to play Planet of the Apes with, at the time, 25 and 30 year old toys. And people are like, you are insane. If you just keep this in good shape, it's worth $200. And I'm like, that's great, but I don't want to sell this in 10 years for $200. I want, I want my, my son the other day said, oh my God, I remember playing with that Hulk. That was a success for me. Like he actually connected and he and I connected over something physical. And so like, I want, I want some more of that and how to bring some more of that nostalgia in. So I'm still playing and it's still really important to, to keep communicating with everybody that's in my generation, but I'm also trying to find a way for their generation too. I think a lot about my kids and sort of what they are, or aren't connected with. And this is a very different generation. Yeah, they're a little bit dark, kids. I mean, the, yeah. the one I like best out of what I'm doing is Die, Rabbit, Die. Yeah. <laughs> You're, You're the perfect it. example. <laughs> Sorry? You're the perfect example of how dark the youth is now. I mean, you. <laughs> I love your set. But well, die, die. I mean, they always ask me about every time. And I thought, I was like, really? I just thought it had been a bit gruesome for them. <laughs> right up their alley. Well, anything, anything that gets yeah, awesome. people, oh. anything that gets people connected to each other. Cause like I said, all of this is, is communication. When you're doing art, you're trying to communicate. And if you're putting your feelings in, you want that to be like absorbed by somebody else. And that's what like fires their neurons about it. Like, Oh man, this really like, this really like got a reaction out of me. Even if 
sometimes. I'm looking in the red. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you know, there's 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 whole families who enjoy going to horror movies together. It's it's a different standard. It's a whole, whole different generation. If you guys connect over that, that's so much more important than worrying about what the material is. I mean, my son and I sit around and watch horror movies movies we watched the new texas chainsaw massacre the other night and he wanted to compare it to the original why why does everybody hate it this wasn't a terrible movie but he understands why people like the original better but this one's cleaner and nicer and looks good but oh i didn't we didn't like the mask as much but why is that oh well the mask is iconic i understand and i immediately like recognize and so like he and i are connecting over stuff like that and all of this stuff is a way to connect to each other it, it sounds insane i'm sitting here working on my computer and sketch card artists are sitting like hunched over their cards but we are we're, we're like communicating man it's like like this is a way for us to to get together and do this stuff well we're gonna have to have you back on to continue this because i have a feeling we could talk for hours about the nostalgia and i would absolutely love to um, sure. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm sure. It, just prevent me from telling the same stories. I gotta. I have to listen to this the night before and be like, okay, stop talking about this. Stop talking about that. <laughs> no, but it really would be great to have you back on, especially after um, the Sasquatch that uh, set has has funded and sold out completely. And and you'll have to come back and tell us what you've learned from from that particular set. Well, I already have an idea too because uh, we moved recently. And I'm still in the process of setting up. Uh, Sasquatch is going to be the first set that I've fulfilled in this space. I fulfilled it in our previous uh, space. So I'm, I'm currently setting up my area. And so I can talk about literally what it takes as far as fulfillment, can show you what this stuff is. Because I think yeah. people think, well, once you have the set of cards, once everybody's sent the art in, then all you got to do is get the cards out to everybody. But there's actually... There's a, there's a lot of a process to that. And so maybe that's a whole like fulfillment and have, we talked about like a lot of the emotions and like how we're thinking about stuff. And that's, that's the thinker end of it too. But there's actually a physical component of sitting down, collating thousands of sets, or do you pay somebody else or do you hire somebody else? I think I, I touched on this briefly before we even hit record. I've kind of reached a bubble of the size I'm at before I can hire help. Um, and I can't hire the help until I have more people buying sets for me, but I can't sell more sets till I can fulfill those sets. And so I am right now in this weird catch 22 of, can I afford to get bigger, but can I afford to not keep expanding because this is, I'm in an actual expansion phase and I've expanded beyond like current it's capabilities. It's a bit more risky now. It's a bit more risky, a bit more bit more tense well yeah by the time i've by the time i've committed to saying hey you're another human being i will pay you x per week to come here for x number of hours like that's a commitment and i somebody else is then going to rely on that and i have to come up with things to not only have that person do so i need to come up with more projects but then i also need to find ways to keep funding that person and justifying that expense and that gets into the business they're really gross maybe we got to talk about the gross we gotta, the we'll have to save that for another yeah. episode we really that sounds, will but this is that's my idea for another episode is absolutely, absolutely genius and we're gonna have you back on as a matter of fact yeah. as soon as we as soon as we end i'll schedule you for schedule you for another round but we're gonna have to say goodbye yep. i'm gonna run out of battery <laughs> 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 thank you so much where can people find you if they want to uh, look you up which i'm sure they will after this uh i mean i'm available on facebook as richard falks okay. uh, or rjf so for richard J, J falks rjf image design is also on facebook uh, my website i'll give you that link they can just find that and click and click so you that that's Website shows that I do so many different things. It's part design, it's part cards, it's part images. Um, that's the best okay. ways. And that even has an email if people need to get a hold of me. Great. Well, all those links are going to be in the description block box below. Just check it all out. And please visit the Kickstarter to the Sasquatch set. Let's just see it go out of the park. Thank you so much, Richard. Lindsay, do you have any last words? 
No, that's everything. I need to go and make the kids tea. He's going to be okay. going to be telling me off soon. <laughs> but no, thank you, thank you, Ingrid Lindsay. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much, you. Richard. This has been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.